uh, now. Uh, D, uh, D functions um, are a very, very simple uh, little way of collecting expressions in APL. And this is the complete DFUN manual. Uh, you can print this little matrix on a piece of card and fold it up and keep it in your pocket. And then you'll know all there is to know about D functions. So we'll, I'll show you. Um, I'll show you what's going to happen, but we'll come back to this uh, screen in a moment. So I'll tell you what I'm going to say. Um, this is the agenda for today. I'm going to spend a little bit, a, a very short introduction on the motivation behind defunds and where their roots are. Um, then we'll spend. Uh, a little time going through the individual parts of D funds to, to talk about alphas and omegas, um, and then just some general techniques and playing around. And then this is a two hour session, so after an hour, we'll have a little break and we'll all do some stretching exercises to wake up. Um, and then in the second half, we'll just look at some examples. There's a there's a workspace called defunds.dws, which is supplied with the prod with uh, dialog, and a lot of people have contributed functions and examples to this. So it's a very rich source of uh, examples, and we'll just look at some of those. Um, and then right at the end, it would be interesting to leave some time <coughs> to discuss issues that arise and um, draw conclusion. So this is the. This is the plan. Um, it's going to be very, very informal discussion. So, uh, partly I tend not to be very good at preparing um, presentations, so I'm just going to type uh, and we'll, we'll start off. Yeah, good. Okay, any questions? All right. Okay. Now, um, uh, the the D uh, the the D funds it's a it's misnomer we couldn't think of a name we had the concept and we couldn't think of a name for this uh, mechanism and it, they started off being called dynamic functions and it was a terrible name you still hear some people um, talk about dynamic functions please come uh, we tend to call them uh, uh, just D functions these days. Um, but the, the concept has a long history. Uh, Ken Iverson uh, introduced a direct definition mechanism uh, in Sharp APL um, and in J, which, uh, which this borrows from. And uh, um, way back in the 1970s. And APLists have used alpha and omega to represent left and right arguments of functions for many, many years in papers, just as a meta-notation. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that DFUNS draws on is the whole school of functional programming. And I hope to, one of the things I would like to achieve today is to try to give you an insight into what um, functional programming means. It's, it's a difficult question to answer but it's a slightly different way of thinking about programming uh, to perhaps what many APLs are familiar with. Okay. Can you, can the people at the back hear me and understand me? Yes? All right, tell me to slow down if you want. They could move forward, but that may not help with the understanding. It will help with the hearing, but... Uh, Okay. Uh, also, I want to keep the, the, the font at this size because some of the examples are wide. So if, you, if that's too small, move forward. Okay, so that's, so that's, the, that's the history. Right. So I'm just going to launch into... Uh, the way the session works is that most of the action will take place on this bottom line and then it will rack up. So make sure you can see that... Uh, um, let me do a, a show of hands. Uh, who has used DFUNS before? Who, yeah? Some, some people have used them, yeah? Okay. And who has programmed APL? You, 
you've written some APL code. Most people have written some APL code. So you, you know you know what to expect with this sort of, uh, this is not news to you. Okay. All right. Okay. So a defun is, uh, we did the agenda, we did that. Right, so a defun, oh, in APL I have functions and arrays. So in this line, um, I have an array and a function and another function and another array. And a defun is just a, another function. And a defun is a pair of curly braces which represents, a, it's just a function. And the left and right arguments with inside the function are represented, alpha represents the left argument and omega represents the right argument. And so we can immediately write some little defunds. Here's a defund. Um, if I do max reduce of omega, this tells me the, the largest item in a vector. But one of the things I might want to do is to find whereabouts in a vector is the largest item. Yeah. So if you know the APL, um, you know what an iota means and you know max reduce, then you can figure out what happens here. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very simple. Uh, um, if effectively, this is a, um, between the braces is a function, and it can be used in any context that a function can be used. Yeah. You get extra points for um, asking questions. I, was asked, I wonder if I have some sweeties to give you that. I don't. So brownie points for questions. Yeah. So this can be used in any context. So for example, I could type, here is a nested array. And I could apply this function under each. Oh, that was unfortunate. <coughs> It's correct, but, but unfortunate. Yeah. <coughs> so it's just a, a defun is just a function, and it can be applied under an operator. Uh, it can it can be used. In particular, um, here is a. Let's just. Um, here is an array, and I can do things with this array. I can add four to it. But the other thing I can do with an array is to name it using the naming arrow. So we're used to this. So the other thing I can do with a defun is use it directly. Oops. I'm, I'm not familiar with this laptop, I'm afraid, so I'm going to make some dreadful. Ah. Okay. It's taken me a bit, forgive me, my keyboard. Right, so this is a defun. And the other thing I can do, maxim, is name it. So naming functions, it uses exactly the same mechanism as naming arrays. There's no intention. This is so simple. I, it's, uh, yeah. So, so far, everybody's up to speed. Yeah. So, I'll show you some more <coughs> defunds. Um, here is another one. I can say, here's a function, famous function for the mean is plus slash omega divide rho omega is a, is a function for mean. And if you want to go faster version, you can do, put parentheses in here. That makes it go a bit faster. Anybody know why? Okay. 
That's right. There, there's uh, there's only one division in that. Yeah. And let's uh, let's name that. Yeah. Here's a function for. Square root, how many get to the power a half is the square root. So you, you must you must know all of this. Yeah, this is just APL, just with omegas and curly braces. And then if I wanted a dyadic function, I could modify this the alpha root. And this would give me the Q root of, let me get this wrong, 27 is a good one, so when this function is called, oh let me just, uh, of course I could use it directly, I could just have typed, I don't have to name functions, I could say the fourth root of 256. So the, 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 this is a dyadic function, so alpha is the left argument and omega is the, is the right argument. We're nearly there. Okay. So that's the first column, well nearly the first column of this, uh, of the reference manual. So we'll just build these things up. So it's very easy to write little inline functions in your code using alpha and omega to compute small functions. And these are relatively high performance. The overhead of including a, of calling a D function is quite low, so you can use those without compromising efficiency. Okay, so those are simple um, one line D functions. Now the other thing I can do with this is to, if I go, if I edit this, you'll have to excuse me, I'm very, very bad at using the mouse. I hate using the mouse because for me a mouse is a relatively recent invention. It's only been around for 20 years or so and I'm very, um, uh, awkward, so I tend to use it, do anything to avoid using the mouse. Uh, sorry? 30 years the mouse, is it? So, okay, it's still pretty new. But let me do that again. Um, so one of the things I can do is edit this function. That This was just opening an edit window on the function. And uh, I can spread this over several lines. It's just the same function. So if I want to do this, and I could put some comments in. Comment every, and comment every line. So far so good. Just add comments. And let's test it. We always like to test in dialog before we ship the software. There you go. And of course I can trace this if I use the tracer. So let me just explain what happens here. If I go over to the session, I can say what's in alpha and what's in omega. I can look at these things. Um, if I execute this blank line, nothing happens. If I execute this line, it just returns the result of the function. So a D, a D function, <coughs> a D function is just an expression. And as soon as that expression is executed, it returns with a result. You get just one chance. As soon as it, so there's no return statement, there's no go to zero. As soon as the defund runs into an expression, the game is over.
So, so far they're of limited use. We can do a lot in APL in a single expression. We can write a lot of APL code using just what we've seen so far. But the next thing I want to show you makes it much, much more powerful. And that's a thing called a guard. And what I'll do with this is to write a Let's write a function called sign. So I'm going to make myself a dfun, and it's going to tell me what the sign of the, whether it's positive or negative or zero, because there is a very simple way of doing this in APL with a signal function. But what I'm going to do here is to say, let me type it in and then I'll show you what it does. If omega is greater than zero, then I want to return the string positive. Otherwise, if omega equals zero, I want to return. Otherwise, if omega is less than zero, and this is a d, this is a d function. So let's trace it and see what happens. So if I say what's the sign of, oh, let me just edit. It should never get to this line because the numbers are either greater than zero or less than zero. So let me do the sign of negative two and trace this. So I'm going to execute the first line. This is in a tracer. It's that focusing, isn't it? Are you seeing a shadow on this? Uh, it's a little bit shadowy, isn't it? I guess you can, you can read it. I used to, I, when I had to, when I was doing my, a hundred years ago I did a maths degree in the University of Manchester and it was a very big set in a very warm room and we used to fall asleep in the back. And there was one lecturer who, I think he was a Chinese guy, and I think he trained as a ninja because he used to walk around while he was talking like this. Because he could walk from this side of the room to that side of the room without noticing. So he'd be dozing off, he'd be there, and suddenly he'd be over there. And it, it kept you awake. It was a very good technique for um, keeping you going. OK, so if I, if I tap over to the session uh, Omega is Neg 2. So what a guard is, is an expression followed by a colon. And the way the DFUN evaluator works is it evaluates this expression to the left of the guard and if it's true then the function, retur it re function returns the evaluation of the expression to the right. So although this is a trivial expression, let me make it a non-trivial expression. Now it's got a little bit of work to do, but not very much. So if omega is greater than zero, then the answer is positive. So in this case it's not, so it drops through to the next line. If omega is equal to zero, it returns the string zero in this case. If omega is less than zero, when I hit enter, it will return that string. Yeah, do you want to see that again? Let's do sign each of one, zero, neg two. So this is going to apply this function first to the number one. So if omega is greater than zero, which it is, we return and the each takes us in again. If it's zero this time, we return that one. And the third time we call this, it'll be negative. So this is a very important part of uh, defense the guard. And in fact I can modify this function because as this will never be called, um, in this case I can remove this guard 
as the default case. So that is normally how I'd code this function. And if we try it again, um, let's try just sine of neg 2. It says, this time we're calling it with neg 2. Is omega greater great than 0? No, it isn't. Is omega equal to 0? No, it isn't. When I execute this line, it's just a single expression. So it's like all of the other functions we've seen. So we just return. So, so far, a defun is a, a collect, uh, is an expression involving alphas and omegas. And uh, uh, we can have guard expressions to, to take subcases. Now I'm going to show you a more. Oh, here's another example. <coughs> um, this is. Uh, I have. Okay, the workspace I have is called dfuns.dws, and that's a supplied uh, workspace. You can find it if you, you can perend load dfuns, and you'll find all of these examples. Um, let me just. Uh, uh, here's another example. Uh, let's say if, if two residue omega, that means if omega is an odd number, yeah, return one plus three times omega. Otherwise, if omega is an even number, return omega divided by two. So that's another example. That's a monadic function. There's no alpha. So here I could do TTT each of the numbers from one to ten. <coughs> and we'd see, um, we could see that working. So it's just a function. That's another example I wanted to do. Right, now the next thing I'm going to do is to show you, uh, the next thing I want to do is to show you a GCD. And what I've written is a <coughs> traditional function. This is not a defund, this is a traditional APL function for finding the greatest common denominator using Euclid's algorithm. Let, let me just show you, let me just do an example and I'll show you this working. So what we might want to do is to find so there's a, a number 105 has components 3, 5, 7 And I want to find the greatest common denominator of 105 <coughs> and uh, and that number. And any guesses what the answer might be? Seven. Yeah. Okay. You cheated. Okay. So in fact, this is an ordinary, I'm going to contrast now the traditional APL approach to the DFUN approach. So in traditional APL, we may code it like this, and if I look at M and N, there, there's the numbers um, 105 and 1001. So what, <coughs> what Euclid told us to do is to say, <coughs> um, while N is not equal to zero, we swap N for N, and we swap N for the N residue of N, in fact, let me just, just change this and put a quad is M and N here. So there's our M and N displayed in a session. So now we swap them and we go around again. N isn't zero, it's... Oh, we just swapped them this time. Right, now this time M and N So the GCD is the, the absolute value of M. That's, that's Euclid's uh, algorithm. And I want to make a point here. This is called procedural programming. What we do is we give a procedure. Euclid gave us a procedure for calculating the greatest common denominator of two numbers. Um, 
So I'm just checking the time. We're, we're, we're on time. We're good. Um, so what we do is typically when we're describing such an algorithm, we say first we set a variable to this, then we do this, then we update it, then we do this, then we do that, then we go around and if this, then we stop and that's the result. So this is the way that um, a lot of APLers are, are familiar with programming. We're just setting variables and changing the variables and going around in loops. Now let me contrast this with the that was uh, the DGCD. I'm going to write this, and you can find actually you don't need to take note. You can find all of these examples in the Defense Workspace, but it, it's um, it's handier if I just type them in for the moment. What I'm going to say now is I'm going to give a definition of the GCD. I'm going to say if omega equals zero then the result is the absolute value of alpha. So that's their guard. Otherwise, the result is omega DGCD of omega residue alpha. And that's it. And that is a, that is a, modulo my typing, if I've made a typo, that's not it, but modulo my typing, that is, uh, <coughs> that's a, that's the GCD algorithm written in, in uh, D. And the very great, the, the difference is that in D funds we don't loop, there is no looping, you can't do that. The only thing you can do is give a guarded <coughs> expression. And this is this would have appealed to you. It, this is it, for, for uh, mathematicians alone. So all we need to do is define a recurrence relation um, for our uh, to, to solve our problem, and that's it. But effectively, nothing is happening there. There is just a a, a recursive definition of GCD. So we could try. Let's try and see if it works. And then I'll trace it. So here I can go and uh, change my traditional to a D and hit return and I get the same answer. And, and this is a cornerstone of functional programming. Functional programming uses recursion in place of iteration. That should be a bound. Recursion instead of iteration. It just defines what the answer is. It doesn't tell you how to do it. It's a declarative style of programming, and it's quite, it's quite distinct. It sometimes get, takes a little to get your, your head around. Yes. So recursion is, um, is, a, is a big thing. It's used, it's used exclusively um, in, uh, in defense for, for controlling. We recur. And it's, and it's used so frequently that we have a special symbol for call. This is a recursive call on uh, uh, on Deacon. In fact, let me let me let me do a little trick here. If I say here quad gets alpha omega, we can watch it working, and you'll see it gives the same numbers in the session as uh, we're going to do a recursive call. So it's doing the same steps. It's actually implemented in the same way, but uh, the philosophy is very different. I is this okay, or do we need to go over this? Yeah, good. No, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. It's very hard to tell whether it's so obvious that we don't know where everybody's lost. Every either everybody's uh, there or lost. So I'll assume, it's your responsibility. If you want me to go over something again, please raise your hand and uh, we'll do that. And I, I, don't be embarrassed. It, uh, the, some of the greatest advances in computer science have come from people not understanding things. And one of my favourites, um, one, one of the greatest advances in um, functional programming, uh, allegedly came from... 
uh, computer scientist, a very clever guy, who'd been given the job of teaching programming to first year geography students who knew nothing about computers. And he was teaching Fortran. And he was trying to explain to them in Fortran what this meant. And they couldn't understand what this means. And the guy was trying so hard, and then he suddenly realised that he didn't understand what it meant either. Um, because clearly, I mean, it doesn't equal something, it doesn't equal something. And he had a sort of eureka moment, and uh, uh, that, was, that was one of the advances. So, um, there, are, there are a lot of things, sometimes if you ask questions. I was giving an APL, introduction to APL talk um, many, many years ago, it was using very early APL systems, and um, I said something like A is 1, 2, 3, and B is 4, 5, 6, which you could do in those days. Um, and somebody said, what would it mean if I typed A space B? And I said, I hope I was polite to the guy. I said, no, you can't type that crazy because you need a function in the middle, it doesn't mean anything. And this guy had just invented vector notation, stranding, which of course we all um, take for granted today. Um, but he couldn't see what was wrong with it. Clearly to him this was a two item vector. But this was way before APL allowed that. So, uh, so sometimes asking a question is a, is a contribution to computer science, so don't be afraid. Right, so um, Dickens use recursion instead of iteration. And they use it to such a great extent, we're always saying, call myself recursively, that there is, instead of typing the name of the function, we can use this symbol, the del, and that just is a shorthand for call myself recursively. And now we've done the whole of the first column of the reference manual. Yeah. So we've done, two, we've done half of the reference manual, and the other half is, uh, oh, we've done guard, we know what a guard is. So we've got a little bit, we've, we're nearly there, and we're in good time. And then we'll go to some examples. Yeah, so let's just test. So this still works uh, with that, with that self-refing. And the, the, the difference between, let me see if I can do this. I'm not sure my, key, my keyboarding skills are good enough for this. No, 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 yeah. Okay, so that's the um, comparison between the two methods of writing that. One is procedural, where you're telling the person, do this, do this, do this. And the other is declarative or functional, when you're just defining the recurrence relationship. And that's such a fundamental, um, it takes some people, it takes a long time sometimes to get into the, this way of thinking about problems. And I'll give you, I, I wrote a paper on this for a conference a long time ago called uh, Modestly Entitled How to Write Computer Programs, um, which explores the difference between these two modes of thinking. Uh, which is, uh, you can find a reference, I'll give you a reference uh, if you want. Okay, now there's one more moving part to the defense are very simple. We like to say though, They've got about the same level of technology as a bicycle. There is only about three or four moving parts uh, in a DFA. So what I'm going to do is to write my... Oh, if I've got a mean function, did I write one? OK. Here's a function to find the mean item of a vector. I'm going to spread it over a number of lines. Yeah. So as we know, this, this one doesn't have any guards. It, it's just all uses the same data. 
But this, this may be a little complex, this, this result expression, and what I'd like to do is to chop it up into, into sub-expressions so that it's easier to read. So what I'm going to do is to say make a... I'm going to make a name here so I can replace this part by sum. So that's a local name. And I'm going, let's do the same one for this. And, oops, no, I don't mean that. Sorry, that's exactly wrong. That's horrible, sorry. That's horrible. Um, that wasn't. Okay. Start again, sorry. Right, so this is the sum. Sum is plus slash omega. Okay, so this is the sum of, now it's the sum of the um, items in a vector. And let's say, let's have a, a, another local for the number of items in a vector is rho omega. And num. And check this works. <coughs> Test it. So it seems to work. So what's happened here is I've the, the a defen is just an expression, which is which is the answer. But I can proceed the expression with a number of local names used in the expression, just to make it easier to read for my for the people that are maintaining it. And when this runs, these are local names that are made dynamically as the function runs. So there's, there's no, it's, they're not made, they're, they're made strictly local names in this. Yeah? Yeah? So a defun is an expression preceded by zero or more local names used in that expression. Any, any questions? We'll, we'll come to some more substantial examples in a moment after the break. This is very nearly all there is to it. Okay, we've seen everything. And those names, of course, the other thing... Okay, look, we tested that. That works. Of course, the other thing is a local name can, can refer to a... Um, Let's change the coding of this a moment. Instead of saying, let's change that sum, <coughs> let's put that back to plus slash, plus slash omega, and let's have a function now. Let's make sum plus slash. So that will do the same thing. Do you agree? So, sum is a plus reduction. Num is the number of items. So the sum of omega divided by the number of them. So I can name in, in defense I can name um, I can name functions and I can name arrays. I do it exactly the same way using the arrow. Yeah, so this the way I would read this is sum names the plus reduction, num names the uh, the shape of omega. And, and the result of the defund is this. <coughs> you see where I am in my thing? Uh, left card, break up, left card. Okay, let me, t I'm going to go into a small point and, yes, we're getting in, we're getting into, we're getting nearly there, right. You, did you? Yeah, you understand. These are strictly local names. I don't. I don't need to put them on a header with a semicolon. I don't need to have an explicit result. Um, it's it's just this. So really, uh, when when we write APL code, what we write it, whether we're writing traditional functions or defunds, what we're doing is collecting APL expressions. We have a, a a way for collecting our APL expressions together into a new function, and the trad funds are one way of collecting them and defunds is another way of collecting them. It's just a different container <coughs> for, um, for our expressions. 
Right. Let me show here's another this is a, an interesting defer. I'm going to write a function that if I say two sum three, two sum three, I want it to say five. I want it I want to write a, a function for doing this. And there are many ways of doing this, of course, including just this way, which is clearly, but here's a more interesting way of doing it. Uh, I'm going to say this won't work under all circumstances, but I'm going to say if alpha equals zero, then the result is omega. So if I'm adding zero to something, then it's just the something. Otherwise, it's alpha minus one sum omega plus one. Think that might work? And I can spell sum like this. So that, that works. So again, if I let's put a tracer in here. So what this is saying really is 2 plus 3 is the same as 1 plus 4 is the same as 0 plus 5, which is 5. And that's exactly what's happening in the definition. Sum is saying, if alpha is 0, then the answer is omega. Otherwise, um, it's 1 less than alpha, alpha sum 1 plus omega. Now, the reason I'm using this example Oh, there's another, there's an, here's another way to write this. Um, let me show you another way to write it. Uh, let's call it sum 2. So we start off the same way. Alpha equals 0, then omega. Otherwise, 1 plus alpha sum, oops, uh, no, 1 plus alpha, alpha minus 1, omega. I wonder if that works. Think that might work? Yeah. So both of those um, are equivalent ways of, um, let's show you these. Those are equivalent ways of writing the same code. They're, they're, you, there are all sorts of ways you could write this um, program, but this is, uh, this is these are not going to work very well with negative numbers, but uh, for, for natural numbers, God's own numbers, they're fine. Yeah. Now there's a subtle difference, and, and it's important in defense, and this is called tail calls. Uh, I'll show you this. This is the first The way this is implemented in the interpreter is that in this one, when the recursive call is made, when sum is called again, it calls uh, on the stack, it calls a new version of sum, and it waits for it to return before adding one to the result. So it, it will call this, it will go around again, and that may call again, and it will wait until it, it returns the result. So what will happen is the stack will grow and grow and grow and grow, and then it will go all the way back adding one to it. And conceptually, the same thing happens here. It, it will say, um, before returning this, it's got to call this sub-function, and, um, and then return the result again. But in this case, because what is returned from here is what is returned from the 
function as a whole, the interpreter can cheat, and instead of call, making a recursive call on the stack, it can cheat by just branching to, to here. So if, if a defun is called and the result of the expression is the result of the defun, which is here, the result of this dyadic function here is the result of the defun, then that's a tail call. It's called a tail call. And you can look this up in Wikipedia. It does a good, ex a good um, job of explaining it. Whereas in this case, I, I don't know what the, the other word is. I call it a stack call. Do you know what the opposite of a... It's a, a non-tail call. Um, the, the thing here is that the, this call is made, but the interpreter can't optimise it. It has to sit there waiting to add one to the result. And if you... Um, the difference, you'll see these two things perform. If you, for large arguments, these things will perform... Um, the, the tail call will perform considerably quicker. And I can show you this, uh, well, let's do a couple of experiments. Um, let's do, uh, first of all I can do, in the defense workspace there's a, there's a function called cmpx which compares expressions. Um, if I do 1000, let's try 1000, sum 22, compared with 1,000, some 2,22. Ah! I wish I hadn't done that. Now I'm knackered. Action, interrupt. Let me, let me modify my... Uh, okay, I don't have one in there. Let me see, this will show you. I, my money is that some will work quicker than some two. Yeah, so it, just in that case. This is the way, this compares to um, expressions. It's a, it's a useful general tool in the defense workspace. But the, the sum took um, uh, 5.70 neg 4 seconds, uh, whereas sum 2 took 8, so it was 39% slower. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's an interesting technique. Tail, if, you, if you're using recursion, tail recursion is better than non-tail recursion. And I think you can prove that you can always turn non-tail recursion into tail recursion. I think there are, you can, I think you can do that. Okay, that's a little advanced topic, but it, uh, um, it's, it's where we are. Okay. Um, the last uh, we're, we're heading up for the break, but uh, let's just go back to the reference manual and check operators. I can do very quickly. Um, I've got two more things to do here. One of the things we like to do in a I wrote a function earlier called root, if you remember, which found the alpha's root. This is just a little tech, this is an additional technique, a new moving part on the bicycle. This is like a bell on the bicycle, it's a new piece of technology. Um, if you remember, this function gave us the alpha's root of omega, so we could ask for the cube root of something, or the square root of something, or the fifth root. The fifth root, the fifth root of... 12 is, anybody? 1.643. Okay. Now one of the things we like to do in APL is to have optional left arguments. So we, in most systems you can omit a left argument um, uh, and give it a default value. Um, so in a traditional function, this won't work in defense, you can say if zero equals the quad n c of left arg then set left arg gets two end if have you seen code like this in a traditional function 
you can say, well, is there a left, has a left argument been passed? If it hasn't, set it to a default value. But in defunds, we have a slightly neater way of saying this. For this one, we just say alpha assign two. And this alpha assign is special syntax. And what it means is, this, this two character glyph is actually one control structure. Alpha assign means if alpha, if a left argument has not been passed, <coughs> evaluate the expression to the right and set it as a value for alpha. So it's a, a very slick way of giving us a default left argument. So now I can say what's the fifth root of, let me do something, uh, what's the fifth root of 81 is this, what's the square root of 81 is this, if I don't give a left argument it defaults to square root. So if I stop before I get here and say what's in alpha, I get a value error. But if I execute this line, it set it to 2 because alpha didn't exist. So if I give an argument, it overrides. So that's a little trick for doing this. And one of the things you can do, which we'll see used for in a moment, is uh, in a general function, A very popular thing to do is to say alpha is. Oh, what is what is? Uh, let me. Okay. What do you think this function does? It's not a trick question, it's really, it just, it just returns its right argument, so it's an identity function. So whatever I give it, it ignores its left argument, and it returns its right argument. Yeah, it's, it's a useful function. Yeah, it's a surprisingly useful function. And one of the things we'll see when we go through examples is it's often useful to set alpha to an identity function, uh, sorry, omega. And then you can say something like alpha, iota, omega. Okay, let's do, I'm going to code my own iota. Let me show you how this works. Okay, I'm going to trace this in a minute, but just guess what's going to happen. So if I say... What are the letters of the alphabet? So in this case, alpha is this and omega is this. So when I do alpha iota omega, I get this, yeah? But if I say iota, iota 7, then alpha doesn't have a value, so this line will fire. So now alpha is the identity function. So what this is going to do effectively is this. So it's going to call monadic iota and just pass the result. So now I can, this is an easy way of making a, a, an ambivalent function. So these are, uh, it took, it, these are very simple but it took the there's a, there's a group called the defense group, sometimes called the functionistas, uh, who, were, who went crazy about this stuff, and it took them quite a while to invent this little technique of, um, of passing. Uh, it passes the valency of the function to a called function. 
So a little little technique for you. Yeah? It's probably obvious, but is it worth pointing out that that omega inside the squiggly is inside your defect? The two omegas that you've got there a different, yes, yes, one, yes, we'll see this in the examples, but here, uh, yes, that's a very good point, and I should have made this, here, there are two, there are two defens, and uh, when, when uh, omega is referenced, it refers to the arguments of the closest enclosing set of curly braces, so, um, this omega, uh, it, it refers to whatever uh, argument is passed to this guy. This omega, when, when the interpreter comes along across an omega, it looks outwards to find where the braces are, and it refers to those uh, those arguments. And you can, the, the thing is, you can. We'll see in a moment some examples. I'll show you some examples where you have, can have deeply nested defens with braces within braces within braces, and it and it's. Uh, completely well defined what that means. Yes, thank you. Yes. One one of my problems is that I've been looking at this for so long I forget those things. Um, okay. I think what we'll do is just go we'll we'll have well I'll just show you what an operator is and that's actually a very straightforward extension. Um, so it won't take long and then we'll have a break and then we'll just go through some examples. Yeah. Um, APL. I didn't write one of them. Honestly, let me copy. Uh, let me. There's a supplied. Well, way back, um, we produced. Um, uh, when Dialog was first produced, it didn't have defined operators, and they 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 appeared in Dialog in 1986, I think. Um, so this was a workspace that we, um, in those days everything was uppercase by the look of it, um, we produced a workspace with some, just some examples of operators. So an example would be, let me find one, I think this is an integration, this does a, an approximate finite integral, very mathematical. This is a traditional operator. Um, have people come across operators in their APL? Yeah, you use the defined operator. Um, so what distinguishes a defined operator is that on, the, on a traditional one is on the header line there are some parentheses that show the name of the operator and then to its left um, the, the, the name of the operand function and then in this case uh, to its right the name of a, uh, the name of the argument so this does a chops the line up into a bit let me see if I can find a more uh, we've got an else oh that's too difficult let me let me write one uh, in fact I think this pretty no let, let me go back to where I was uh, Okay, so if I have a function, alpha and omega refer to the left and right arguments. If I have an operator, I have both arguments and I have operand, typically operand functions. And the way we refer to operands are using alpha alpha and omega omega for the left and right operands. And the rule is that if either of these characters these um, not characters. These tokens, multi-character tokens, appear within the braces. Then this is an operator. So defens don't have a header line, so you, you don't get any help there. So an example of an operator might here's a nice operator twice. So what this is going to do is to apply its operand function twice to its argument. 
So an example might be if I use the display here's my display code if I do the display the end close of hello it looks like this if I do display end close twice on hello it looks like this and if it, so it gives exactly the same answer as if I'd done the end close end close so if I trace this, we can see what's happening. Alpha alpha in this case is just enclose. Omega is hello. So it's just going to apply it twice. So there's, there's almost nothing else to say about operators. If, a, if an operator wants to call itself recursively, it uses del del yeah. and there's, there's a little um, ok let me think, think of a good example for this uh, ok let me write a, let me write a power operator um, This is going to apply right this is going to let me see if I can do this. What I want to do is use the left argument as a count. So I'm going to say if alpha equals zero, then omega. Otherwise alpha minus one uh, alpha minus one Alpha alpha del del and let me just let me see this the first rule of frisbee is never predict what's going to happen just say watch this um, if I say display the th three how enclose how of let's see what happens if I do display the 10 enclose if I say display the 0 enclose power of hello I just get hello so the left argument is telling me how many times to apply the function so if I just use 3 here we can watch this working so what this is going to do alpha in this case is 3 Alpha alpha is enclose. So what this is going to do is to apply alpha alpha omega. So it's going to do the enclose on the, the right here. The first thing it's going to do is apply the function once. And then it's going to call the operator recursively with the same operand function one less time. Bang. Yeah? Yeah. So that's a, a, a homemade power operator. And it turns out that <coughs> this sequence of the the operator bound with its okay, let me just show you something here. Here is a here is an operator reduction and here is a an operand function. And when an, when a function binds with an operator it produces another function. So plus slash is a function, a derived function. And it's com this is completely analogous to this um, Hi Bob, come, come in. We're, we are now in the presence of greatness. Just, just, just embarrass you a little bit. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm doing this, this completely wrong I, Okay, let me just say here. And um, the the the, the uh, Queensbury rules we're operating under here is shout out if you have any questions. Shout those are the rules. So <clears throat> what's happening here? This plus slash is uh, a function bound with an operator, which makes a function, 
And this is a, a function which we saw as enclosed bound with an operator, so that makes a function. So it just calls the same derived function uh, at the same time. And this is used so frequently that in this case we can shorten, let me just go into the editor, we can shorten this to just this. So a del del means call the operator recursively, but del means call the derived function recursively, which is the operator bound with its operand. It's a shorthand. And it, it, looking at a statistical sample, it's almost always used like this. You rarely use uh, call the operator. There are examples when you do. So this is a homemade power function, let's just check it works. Let's call a display of the three, three enclosures of power. So in this case alpha is three, so it's not equal to zero. So we're going to call the derived function again. And this time alpha is two. The derived uh, uh, the operand function is still enclosed. Yeah. And we've now done, uh, it's about time for a break. What we'll do is take a 10 minute break. But the only thing we're missing, we've done the whole of the reference manual now, except for there's a little thing here called an error guard, which will arm up very quickly. And there's a way of returning. Um, Dialog has this concept of a shy result where a function can choose to give a, a, re, a, res, a, a shy result that needs coaxing out of the function so that if the context doesn't want a result, it's just disposed of. So the only two things in the whole reference manual, we've just got two more things to do. So what I suggest we do is take a, maybe a five minute break if you want to get a drink of water or something and we'll just stomp around and what's the time? Well, let's meet back at 10 minutes too. That gives us 40 minutes to finish up to look at examples. Yeah? So, okay, let's have a break.